Maggie. Maggie, where, where are you from originally? Um, Northern Virginia, just outside of Washington, D.C. And what brought you out here? Excuse me. Um, well, what brought me to Los Angeles was treatment originally, um, and that was in 2015. Which, which drug? Um, at that time, it was alcohol. Um, I've been using drugs since I was, I mean, well, if you include weed and alcohol, like 15, but I've been using heroin on and off since I was 18. Um, I was able to put it down for um, about 12 years, but I became a raging alcoholic and crack smoker. And um, so then in 2014, I was in a horrific motorcycle accident. And uh, a man with cataracts hit me from behind. The irony of this story is that I got offered a 60 days sober, got offered to go to the bar that night, and I chose to go home. And I got hit and thrown from my motorcycle and opened my eyes when I land on the ground, and the car is still coming straight for me. If I, if, if I had just gotten knocked off my bike, I would have had a broken wrist and some scrapes. But I'm lying there and the car literally runs me over with its front and rear passenger tires like I'm a speed bump. Um, luckily, I'm blessed because it shattered my pelvis. But a little bit lower, I would have been paralyzed and a little bit higher, I would have been dead. I mean, you can't even tell looking at me today. No, you, um, and uh, my pelvis was shattered. Only 9% of the time when the bones break in that way, if you don't die on impact, they rupture an internal organ. And that didn't happen either. But, um, so that was in 2014, and 2015, like right after that, like as soon as I got out of the hospital, I was like, give me a bottle. Like, I ah, fuck this, like, forget it, like, forget sobriety. Um, and I was on all kinds of opiates. I mean, they had the button, they had everything. I mean, literally, they, my pelvis was shattered, and that's the term in the ER report. Um, and uh, at this point, I was actually a professional um, Broadway jazz dancer. I danced in the company of Chicago, I've danced with Lion King, um, and my pelvis didn't heal correctly. And so now I've got one leg that's shorter than the other. Um, and dancers, if their hips aren't aligned, basically their career's done. So um, that was also another major you know, blow. Um, and like I said, at this point, I hadn't done um, heroin in uh, about nine, nine and a half, 10 years. And um, I didn't abuse the prescription medication, but I drank like a fish. And um, so I came out here to Palm Springs for treatment. And uh, then I got sent to an IOP and a sober living out here. And I was sober for a year and a half. And um, after that year and a half, I'd had a botched surgery at John Hopkins. They told me my pelvis was healed. They took out all the hardware and they were wrong. Um, my pelvis broke away, the right side, broke away from the base of my spine. And they took out the bolt, if you will, the screw that was holding that together. And uh, so for a while, my right leg was not attached to the rest of my body and I had to have a fusion at the base of my spine. And the recovery from that surgery was hellacious. I had extreme nerve damage. I had uh, a pool of blood dry under an incision. And um, I was having excruciating nerve pain going down my leg. And there's, I mean, no amount of opiates will touch nerve pain. There's just really nothing other than um, gabapentin and maybe Lyrica that touches nerve pain. But this was so excruciating and the surgeon was like, there's nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong. You know, it's just nerve pain, head of ortho procedures. And um, I, I relapsed after a year and a half um, sober. Um, my boyfriend was moving all of his stuff out of our apartment while um, <clears throat> I was having a procedure done and they found a softball sized mass on my pelvis that no one had told me about. Now I, I never got angry at God when the accident happened. I wasn't literally before the second tire went over me I said okay God here we go and not you know like all right I'm gonna die I just uh, like you're with me no matter what and um, and at this point I, I was angry. I, I was distraught. Why did you save my life to make it this hell? Why? Like, what? You know, I, I, I gave glory to God and professed your name. Like, why? Why? Um, and so I relapsed. Um, I went, I Googled, literally, Googled um, where to find drugs in Los Angeles, because I hadn't used to. And uh, it sent me to MacArthur Park. Um, yeah. yeah, it's cleaned uh, up a little bit now. Here, but... Yeah, um, anyway, well, that, that's, that's where I went. And, uh, it's, it's a lot cleaner now than it was. This was in 20, 2017, um, about February 2017. And, uh, you know, I relapsed on heroin. Uh, my drugs of choice are alcohol, heroin, and crack. Um, and I, I just I threw it all away. I was so emotionally broken at that point. Um, <clears throat> and <clears throat> so <clears throat> since that surgery in 2017, um, and the fact that I was already an addict, coupled with the fact that I got a large amount of money, because yeah, the accident wasn't my fault. I was gonna ask, yeah, you might get some, so. Yeah, 
and um, so it, I I relapsed and I have not been able to to get it back since 2017. Um, in the past, I've had um, my first time in treatment was when I was 18. Um, at the third time I went to treatment at 20 years old, I got two years sober, um, and I've had and then um, I've had like nine months and then that year and a half. But since that um, surgery, I just haven't been able to get it back. Got really bad chronic pain. Um, and, you know, if we want to do statistic wise, like, <clears throat> they're even lower for people with chronic pain. Um, not saying that it can't be done, because there are people that do it. And I got sober. Um, I ended up down in Skid Row um, about two years ago for the first time. And like I said, I had a lot of money. Um, I didn't have to sell myself for drugs. I didn't have to. Robbing, stealing has never really been my thing. Um, um, if I if I need to, I'll, I'll prosecute myself um, because I can accept responsibility for that. And I'm also not going to have someone else try and control me. You know, there's guys that want to like dangle drugs in front of you, and I'd much rather go out and and make it myself and um, compromise myself rather than compromise anyone else. I, I don't know if I feel like there's some odd integrity in that. Um, for whatever that's worth, if that makes any sense to anybody. Um, and, sorry, I'm kind of jumping all over the place. Uh, so I ended up living down here for three months. And um, I met a girl that I call my Skid Row Angel. She was in a situation where she was being beaten and needed to get out of it. And I just did the next right thing and helped someone, you know, have a place to stay. And said, you can stay in this hotel room, pay the guest fee if you need to. And I don't think I'd be alive today down here if it wasn't for her. Um, and, you know, I, I really got blessed in that way. Um, but I stayed down here for three months. I hope you heard from you. Basically. And God, God, I just did the next right thing. And um, then I went to treatment. I mean, I've been in and out of treatment for the last two and a half years. And, um, but I, I wasn't done. I knew that I wasn't done. I went because my sister was absolutely distraught. Um, she's 50. She's my stepsister, technically. Her mother died when I was 16 of breast cancer. And she, since then, has taken on the role of being like a sister mom. And she was tracking me everywhere I went down here. I let me a letter, you know, like safety-wise, but. So that was your mom as well, who passed away? Uh, it's my stepmother. Your stepmother. Mm -hmm. My, a uh, little bit of background, my parents got divorced when I was, when my dad asked for a divorce when I was like not even like six months old. Um, he was planning on leaving, and then my mother got pregnant and his father had done that to his mother. So he thought that it was better to stay until after the birth and then ask for one, um, which, you know, whatever. Uh, and so um, my parents didn't think they could have kids. It was a bit of an accident. I have a brother who's adopted from Santiago, Chile. Um, my mother um, got pregnant when she was younger before <clears throat> um, abortion was illegal and she did what she had to do. And so because of that, she thought that she was permanently damaged, and then I came along. And um, so my dad left, <clears throat> and um, he was, I'm half Mexican, and there's a term that we call Mujeriega, she's a womanizer. And in his prime, he was a bit of a womanizer. So he was cheating on my mother with several different women, but then he ultimately married one of them. And that is my sister's mom. And she, is basically, it's like I almost had two mothers because my mom will give you the shirt off her back. She's the most caring woman. She's a retired elementary school principal um, and she loves just anybody, just off the bat, just because. And, um, but as far as her independence and strength as a woman, that, that's not her forte. It's just, this is not. Um, and uh, I got that. I get my independence and my strength from my stepmother. Um, so she passed away when I was 16. And my sister has kind of been like a sister mom since then. Um, so I went to treatment because I couldn't, I couldn't listen to how, I couldn't put it through that anymore, but I wasn't done. And, um, and that was uh, May of last year. Um, and then I, I relapsed maybe two or three months after being sober. I was on the East Coast uh, at this point in a program in Baltimore and uh, I just I wasn't done and um, my parents sent me or I, I chose to come back out here to where it had some success 
and that was in January of this year. And I sat in the program, I knew I wasn't done, I still had some money in the bank, and um, I chose to come back down here. I had a room at the hotel I stayed at before, and I lived down here from January until July. Um, and the money ran out. Um, well, as much as I, I signed, anyway, there's no thing. The money ran out, let's just put it that way. Um, and I went to treatment, just like I said I was going to. And this was in July, and I was in treatment for a month, and I got about two months sober. Um, and then uh, about a month ago, I, I couldn't even necessarily tell you what happened. Normally when I relapse, I see it coming. I see it, I know it's gonna come, I understand it. I went to church on Sunday morning. Um, a guy had hurt me really bad the night before, and I felt like, like this is a guy that took advantage of me, the same guy that left me when, when, I was, um, when I was going through that procedure and I relapsed. He claims he's got seven years sober, but he stole my medication and like, it's just all messy. And him and I began talking again when I was sober this last time. And he told me that he didn't really want to be with me. He, slowed, he wanted to slow things down. This is somebody who chased after me, wanted to propose to me. I was at like my lowest point. I wanted nothing to do with him because he took such advantage. And I thought, if he, if I, if he doesn't even love me, if I'm not even good enough for him to love me, then, then what's the point? Um, I mean, he should be begging for, 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 for me to grace him with his presence. And I know that sounds egotistical, um, but it just, it just really hit. And uh, like I said, I went to church, I went for some wings afterwards, football was on at Buffalo Wild Wings, I ordered a beer. One beer later, I'm back down here. And I mean, I could go right back, and, but that's what I always do. And right now, I, I feel like I have to take the time to, f I can't do the in now. I can't disappoint my family like that anymore. I can't do it to myself. It's so demoralizing. Um, the rooms of AA are supposed to be welcoming and they're not always that way. Um, and uh, I just have to figure out whether or not I'm ever gonna wanna be sober or whether I need to figure out a way to just live my life while I'm doing this because I'm just not gonna put it down and be honest with myself. Um, how I started using in the first place, um, you know, there's a, the suburbs can be just as messy as the ghetto. Um, we just put on a better facade. Uh, at five years old, my brother began molesting me, my adopted brother. Um, and at this point, he had so many mental, he has so many mental issues. Um, He's developmentally about five to seven years behind his actual age, which isn't that big of a deal now that he's 40. But back then it was, it was, it was, it was about 12, you know, it was a big deal. He was a, his mother was on everything under the sun, 13 years old in Chile, when she, during the pregnancy and gave birth. And then he was in the orphanage until, for like five years, which is a long time. I actually have a friend from high school who was in the exact same orphanage as my brother, adopted right at birth. And then my brother, and it's just, it's almost like how they used to give kids opium in the 20s because they didn't know it was bad for them. They didn't know how to handle his emotional disorders. They, they, they didn't, and they, you know, did the best that they could, I guess. But, um, so I was constantly getting blamed for stuff that he was doing, so I was terrified to say anything. You know, I just thought I would get blamed. You know, my parents couldn't fathom that he had this many issues. Um, and so, you know, I finally said something and, um, to my mom and, uh, yeah, he, after he ultimately raped me, um, he would call it tickling. I've also seen my brother, um, we went to pick him up for his weekend with my mom, and uh, he didn't want to go. So um, he jumped out of the car, and my dad told my mom I'd go wait at the house. He comes in through the back door with a big butcher knife, gets on top of my mom on the couch and takes it to her throat. And uh, I was maybe nine years old, and I just went screaming bloody murder. I've seen him attempt to kill probably every member of my family. He attempted to set my mom on fire when I was three. Um, and it's, uh, it's just, you know, that I didn't even remember the abuse until I was in high school at a church retreat. And um, the first time I did heroin, I felt like I didn't have to worry about anything anymore. I didn't have to be the mediator between my parents so that I could make sure that I got my needs met. So I could make sure that I had money for the school trip or this or that because mom didn't want to talk to dad and dad didn't want to talk to mom. And, um, and after my stepmother died at 
when I was 16, my dad became very selfish because he felt that he'd been a caregiver for so long, he didn't need to anymore. Not to forget the fact that he has a special needs son and a 16 year old daughter. Um, and so it's just, I, I was 18 years old. I, I didn't even know that you could do heroin any other way than shooting it. I was dating this guy um, and uh, I tried it and it was an instant love affair. Um, and that, like I said, that was at 18. And I dealt with a lot of those emotional issues in my first couple of treatment centers. And I think that's part of the reason why I didn't go back to it, even though I did drink and do other stuff, but I didn't go back to that particular substance. Um, and uh, so there's just, then the accident happened and it, I just kind of thought, okay, God, you know, I kind of met my quota for trauma for, the, for my life. You know, all right, we're good, we got out of the way. Okay, fine, cool. Um, you know, I'm good to go. And then the accident happened. And like I said, my pelvis was shattered. Now, even though that no one was raping me in that sense, it brought up a whole bunch of, it, it reopened all of those wounds. Um, and I, I mean, I didn't, I didn't know, you know, I didn't think that, you know, getting run over a car, but by a car was gonna, you know, bring up some of the abuse and everything. Um, again, I felt like I was just being re-traumatized. Um, and so it's, you know, I had my fair share of, you know, um, like everybody does. I, I don't like to compare. Some people are like, oh, my trauma's worse than your trauma. Like, trauma's trauma. I don't know how you cope or relate to your trauma and how, how that affects you. And you don't know how it affects me. Something that doesn't affect me at all might devastate someone else. Um, and I do look at some, my compassion as a blessing out of what happened with my brother. Unlike your average rape victim or rape abuser where you can just X them out of your life and everybody hates them and you know, you know, dad comes to the rescue and like, you know, how dare they, you, you can't get, you can't get rid of him, you know, and, uh, and you have to figure out a way to cohabitate. And um, today he's gay and, you know, he, it's hard for him to even admit what happened. He has, um, he has his own struggles with alcohol um, and we have a very minimal relationship. And I'm able to set boundaries, and I just really don't speak to him, um, for the most part. Who do you speak to still in your family? My sister, my mother. Um, I don't speak to my father while I'm using. Okay. I barely talked to my father in the last year. I was supposed to meet him at a baseball game last Labor Day, and instead I got high, and uh, I, yeah. Seattle. No, my family's all back. Well, my sister's in Seattle. And um, the rest of my family's in Virginia. So you were, you were back home? Mm -hmm. oh, I see. Yeah, this is when I was in Baltimore. Um, I had like those few months. Um, and I mean, they just, like my sister says that I'm, I'm a good, I'm a drug addict, but I'm a good person. And she said, that's what makes it so difficult. If you're a horrible person, like it would be so easy to hate you, you know, or to you know, be mad at what you're doing. Um, and and I, I don't even, and I don't necessarily use today because I hate myself. I, I don't. Um, I'm not entirely certain why I use. I don't know. I mean, I've been to 16 treatment centers. That doesn't include detoxes and outpatients. Um, and, you know, I really thought this time, like, I was in a great space. I, did, I just didn't see this coming. I didn't, and that, that's, that's what... I guess has got me so thrown for a loop right now. Um, what, do you, what do you think the solution might be to get clean for you? If it isn't that you just hate yourself like a lot of the people here do, their, their standards are so low that, that this environment and drug abuse and all that works for them because it's where they subconsciously rest. But for you, you, you know, you were a dancer, you were very accomplished. So for you, it's, it almost seems like a very different animal. People view me as smart here. People view me as, you know, some as a sucker too, but um, people, um, I feel like, you know, I try to do the next right thing and like maybe if I wasn't here, like there was a woman, she's my mother's age and she she'd gotten robbed of her bag of clothes and everything and this was back in like 
March, and she was freezing outside of the bank, and she never asked me for drugs, she never asked me money. I don't think she'd ask me for cigarettes. And, and, you know, I saw her one night, and, you know, I went to my hotel room and got her blankets and everything. And, like, who would have done that? And I kind of feel good about myself. My struggle is when I get clean, they want us to sit in programs for like the first year, don't do anything, don't, don't get involved in it. I, I can't do that. I've been such a waste of space for so long that I feel like they really need to look at more of how they do it in like Portugal, where they give people a purpose. The opposite of addiction is connection. Yeah. And, uh, mm -hmm. and the, other, the other part of it is purpose. You know, addicts and alcoholics are such passionate people. And you know, we've got so much to offer, we feel, um, and we care so much that what do we do with all this extra energy that maybe other people are like, why do you even give a crap, you know? Um, or how does that affect you? Like, oh, I don't even care, don't, don't let it affect you. And, and my thing is like, I gotta get back into doing something. But instead it's like, and then you got the insurance systems where they wanna keep you in treatment because they're making money. You've got treatment centers that are paying you to go. They've got treatment centers where people are coming in and that work for the treatment center, been hired by the treatment center to convince you to relapse so that you have to go back to their treatment center and then all over again and get all the insurance money. And, now, listen to your story, and, and certainly you've been through a lot, so there's that, but you also seem to have the resolve and wherewithal to, to do great things in life, which a lot of these people I've spoken to kind of just don't for, for a multitude of reasons. And it almost seems like what might save you <laughs> is a great relationship with somebody. You know? Yeah. I don't know what the solution is to that. I don't, I don't know where you go about finding that, but miracles like that do happen. They do. Because I, I can't. Because, because like going to another treatment, it's like, that's not going to do it. You're too smart. Finding something to replace your creative outlet. I mean, I've got that, ideas. That, that might be helpful, but that in combination with someone in your life could be good. I, I would have to agree with that, you know, because I do stay sober. Like, when I was with the guy for, you know, I had a year and a half, and like, um, and then when things like that fall apart, you know. Yeah, which they do. Which they do, and it's like how, I also tend to in relationships, so I did a lot of work on my, on my romantic, well, just in general relationships. And one of my character defects is that I will give and give and give of myself, and then expect the other person to do the same, and they don't. And I sacrifice my own needs because I'm like, okay, what's well, my turn to sacrifice? They're gonna, they're, I'm gonna need them at some point, and and you know, this is just what you do in relationships. And then time after time, I'm not met with the same, with the same love and care and concern and acceptance that I met them with. Um, and that, that's, that happens in a lot of my relationships. You know, not just romantic, but friendship. And so, you know, that's, that's something I have to look at because I, I didn't realize that I have unrealistic expectations of people. Yeah, well that, that's, that's on you to figure out. Right. You can't you can put the finger at other people all the time. Right. But that's, that's ultimately something you're doing. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for telling me your story. Thank you. Very interesting. And you're very different from everyone I've spoken to here. You don't, you don't look the part, and you also clearly aren't your typical skid row. I get that, yeah. yeah. Well, good luck. Thank you for talking. Right, thank, thank you for being patient. Yep.